Hello, in this example, we're looking at vibrational spectroscopy of diatomic molecules, in this particular case, oxygen. We have energy associated with different vibrational transitions from the ground state to the first excited state, ground state, second excited state, ground state to third excited state. Um, and those are given in units of wave numbers, and we're asked to calculate what is the vibrational transition wave number in this XB. This is called the enharmonic constant, and we're going to look at where this term comes at. I know that there's this point which counts as my ideal bond length, and this bond can stretch or compress around that equilibrium geometry. That's what it's represented in this one point. Remember, positive displacements, that bond is stretching. Negative displacements, the bond is compressing. Whenever the displacement is occurring, there's a restoring force that pulls the atoms back to the equilibrium position. Now, this potential energy of my molecule can be represented by this Taylor zero expansion. In the first term, we can put it at any, uh, at any value, it can be arbitrarily set to zero, and this is what we're doing in this particular in this particular diagram, then the first derivative evaluated at this displacement zero uh, from my graph is going to be a minimum, so the derivative at a minimum is going to be equal to zero, so those two terms end up uh, being zero, the first term that survives in this analysis, the uh, potential energy is proportional to the displacement square. Uh, so that proportionality constant is the force constant for that spring, in this case the stiffness of the bond, uh, for, to relate it to some physical quantity, and the fact that it's quadratic, the potential is quadratic with the displacement, that's what we're representing here with this parabola. Now this was the motivation for what we call the harmonic oscillator model, and with that we found that the energies coming from the solution of the Schrodinger equation using this type of potential were quantized, and the energy was indicated by this equation, where uh, epsilon is the vibrational quantum number, and we have h-bar omega, uh, where omega was the angular frequency for that particular vibration. Now, what we found also is this vibrational quantum numbers can take values from 0, 1, 2, etc., and that this h-bar omega was the spacing between the different vibrational levels. Now, if we wanted to get this energy in terms of vibrational terms, we use the factor h-bar time, sorry, h times c, h being the Planck's constant, c, the speed of light, so we take the energy divided by this, and we get the vibrational term. Both of them indicate energy, but the tilde also is giving you that this, uh, this term is in units of wave numbers, most commonly in terms of centimeters to the minus one. Now, this new tilde, new is is vibrational transition wave number that it's given in terms of this force constant in the effective mass of your molecule. Now also from this harmonic model, the vibrational selection rules coming from this were that for in order for a transition to be allowed, there needs to be a change in the vibrational quantum number that will have to be plus or minus one. Plus for absorptions, minus for um, emission. But also it has to go uh, along with a change in the molecular electric dipole moment. And with that, we can then calculate using this vibrational selection rule, what will be the change in the energies once a transition going from a vibrational number and one that is above that, um, how much that energy is involved in that transition. And this indicates that the change in the energy given for uh, vibrational terms for, uh, for vibrational levels that are separated one unit away. Okay, now that's good, but we have to remember that this is just an approximation, and it's more striking when we put these two potentials together, the parabolic potential that defines the harmonic oscillator problem, with the actual potential that you're going to get for a physical object, in this case the molecule. And one of the things that we can observe is that in the harmonic oscillator, uh, even with high excitation energies, high vibrational quantum numbers, there's still always a, um, an energy level, even if it's very high energy. Um, but there's always one, right? So what we found that at very high energy levels for this, the quantum behavior gets lost and goes into a classical behavior for this harmonic motion. But then we have to think about even a step further and, and say, what's going to happen if we have a very high excitation energy and then this vibrational motion that we think of in the harmonic oscillator model, where it's stretching very far away because now it has a lot of energy and also is vibrating very fast. But at some point, we can think about if the molecules or the atoms making up that molecule are going too separated away from one another, then the bond is going to break. And that is actually what we observe in this potential energy for the molecule, where at some point, the separation between the atoms is far enough that for all purposes, the molecule is dissociated. Okay, so this approximation, this parabolic approximation is not very good at high excitation energies. That's where we are seeing the, uh, the actual potential we have to reproduce with a model will have to follow this same shape. Uh, with that, now we can think about the different parameters that are involved into this potential. So the first one that we already knew from, even from the harmonic oscillator, is the, the zero point energy of my molecule that will correspond to the ground state vibrational level and all the way to whatever the molecule is dissociated. So that's going to be the dissociation energy for my molecule, and I have another term in here that is related to the, the depth of my potential well. Now, 
one of the things that happened is that because of this asymmetry of my potential, the restoring force is no longer proportional to the displacement. So in order to capture that, we need to introduce this other term, anharmonicity. Well, one model of the potential that can uh, you, be used to represent this better is the so-called Morse potential. This is not the only one, but it's one that works uh, pretty decently. Uh, and this is the expression of the Morse potential. Uh, you should probably recognize these from very early on when we were thinking about uh, operators, and one of the operators was the potential energy, and we actually describe how to convert this potential uh, function into a, an operator in quantum mechanics. Anyway, so this is the definition. You can see that it's uh, given in terms of the potential, uh, of the depth of the potential well, and uh, it has an exponential term that is related to the angular frequency, the effective mass of the molecule, and this uh, depth of the potential well. Okay, so with this, the vibrational terms that we get are similar to what we had to the harmonic oscillator, but now the introduction of this extra term in here, that now is quadratic in terms of the vibrational quantum number. So this one comes from the solutions of the Schrodinger equation given um, the, this potential. This term here, that it's actually the one that we've been asked for in the problem, this is referred to as the anharmonicity constant. It's a dimensionless positive parameter uh, by means of this equation. One of the other things that we ought to define for this particular problem is that because we're reproducing this type of potential, the vibrational quantum numbers are going to be capped at a vibrational quantum number max. What is that? Well, it turns out that at some point, if the molecule is dissociated, then there must be a maximum quantum number that goes exactly to that energy that uh, where the, um, the molecule is completely dissociated. So that also means that the energy levels in this anharmonic type of potential uh, are finite not infinite as in the case, for example, of the harmonic potential, which is good, you know, which is good because this is reproducing experimentally what we will be observing. Now, this model, the Morse potential, is pretty great uh, for some theoretical treatment, but in reality, in practice, what people do to actually um, fit data in order to calculate, for example, the, uh, the dissociation energy for a molecule is to use this more general expression. And now, these two are anharmonic, uh, anharmonicity constants, and those are, again, dimensionless parameters that are going to be used to fit the data. So with this, with this in mind now, we can calculate what is the energy difference between energy transitions from one vibrational quantum number to the next. And then the only thing that we are going to be doing is using this equation to substitute it in terms of the corresponding vibrational quantum number. And then with this expression, you're calculating the difference in energy between vibrational energy levels that are separated one unit away. And whenever you add all of those here, this is what you will end up using to calculate the dissociation energy of your molecule. So from the vibrational quantum level all the way to uh, optimal max, the addition of the energies of all those different transitions is what you will end up adding to calculate the dissociation energy of your molecule. Okay, another interesting factor about these at harmonicity is the presence of overtones. And those overtones are transitions that you will not expect if you're only thinking in terms of the harmonic oscillator. Because the selection rules for the harmonic oscillator, remember, are delta, nu delta epsilon equals plus minus one. But the overtones in this case are transitions from the ground state to the second excited state, from ground state to the third excited state, etc., which is what we are looking in this table. So this table is giving me information about something we call overtones. They do exist. But remember, this simplification of the uh, selection rules were simplified because they were derived from the harmonic oscillation, oscillator, which was only an approximation. So those selection rules are only approximately valid in the realm of unharmonicity. All the transitions are in principle allowed, but the caveat here is that intensities of the uh, peaks that you will observe are going to be much smaller whenever you have the, the change in the quantum number larger than one. Okay, so taking this expression for the vibrational term, we can calculate what is the energy that will correspond to these transitions. This one is what we call the fundamental transition. This one is the first overtone. This one is the second overtone. So if we're interested in the overtones, we can take the expressions for the, uh, the vibrational terms and we calculate the change in the energy, considering that the initial state is the ground state and it goes to a excited vibrational state. So we can do this first in a general, in a general way, which is substitute the proper values. We know that the initial, initial energy level is always the ground state, so the vibrational quantum number that corresponds to that is zero. So if we do all the algebra that we need to do in order to expand this expression that it's quadratic, I can cancel terms that I can cancel, and I end up with the terms that survive that tells me that in order to calculate um, energies for transitions starting from the ground state, uh, it's going to be given by this expression. This vibrational quantum number is going to be the in, it's going to be uh, corresponding to the uh, final state where the transition is occurring. So delta G for this zero to one, the fundamental transition, and then I can calculate zero to two, the first overtone, or zero to three, the second overtone. So what happens when I do the actual substitutions to evaluate this numerically? The 
fundamental transition, I substitute the vibrational quantum number equals to one. So I end up that for this particular energy of that transition, I'm gonna have this expression in terms of the vibrational transition wave number of my molecule minus two times these unharmonicity um, factor that I have this unharmonicity constant times the vibrational transition wave number, the coefficient on this expansion that I have for the energy. And that gives me equal to this value in wave numbers, which is actually that I got this from my table. For the first overtone, transition from ground state to the second excited state, now the final state is equals to two, so I make the substitutions, and then I end up finding this equation. And because this is the first overtone, zero to two, it's gonna correspond to the values that I have in this table, so I can, all of that should be equal to this value. Now, if you notice, this is nothing else than a system of two equations with two variables. So you can solve these any way you want. And uh, once you solve that, you are gonna find the values for the vibrational transition in wave numbers, just because this is the way that I set up the problem. Remember, the tilde is telling you that it's in uh, energy associated in wave numbers and the value of the unharmonicity constant. So using Mathematica, I'm gonna set up this system of equations. I'm gonna be using the function solved and I wanna solve this system of equations where I have two variables, alpha and beta. So I'm solving for those two variables in this equation. And those alpha and beta corresponds to, in this case, alpha, the vibrational transition wave number. And that's why I'm associating this with alpha. And then the other term is gonna be beta, the product of the unharmonicity constant times the vibrational transition wave number. So that's why I'm gonna take the value of beta and I'm gonna divide it by the vibrational transition wave number. And that's gonna allow me to calculate directly the value of the unharmonicity constant. So now, uh, just remember in terms of the syntax for your Mathematica file, you have the equation equals equals, so double equal the value that you are assigning it to. And then the second equation, you can um, tell Mathematica with this double ampersand and and. Uh, the second equation, the same idea, you set up your equation, don't forget equals equals, and then the value that you want to assign or that it's given in your equation. So with that, I'm storing these values in the variable solutions. And then what I'm just doing is I'm going to be taking the values that will correspond to the first coefficient and the second coefficient in this array. And the solutions that I got are exactly what I was having here. Okay, I hope this is helpful and let me know if you have any questions.